Mark. Hi, Mark. This is Patrick. Hi. How are you doing? Thank you so much for taking the time to come on with us. Oh, yeah. No worries at all. So, yeah, I'm sitting here with my co-host, Connor. Hey, Mark. How you doing? Hi, Connor. And uh, can you hear us okay? I can hear you okay. All right. Great. Well, thank you so much, man, for coming on the show. Um, yeah. It's such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I know. So this is outstanding for us. And I do want to let you know, we have a lot that we want to cover tonight. So if it's all right with you, let's go ahead and jump into it. Let's, Does that sound let, good? Sure. Let's jump into it. Okay. Yeah. So first things first, we do want to just know, well, a little a little background about us a little bit, just so you kind of know where we're uh, coming from. So I'll, I'll be honest, we, you know, we aren't flat earthers, but we're, I would say we're flat earth skeptics, if that kind of makes sense. That's and, fine. And really, we, we have just kind of an open mind about this thing and are really just kind of looking to learn. Okay. Um, and so it's, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Sure. And uh, we, we kind of came to know about you through the Netflix documentary, as I'm sure a lot of people have. I, and, um, I was surprised at how many people watch the Netflix documentary when it came yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, so. no, it's, it's super popular, and, and yeah. it was it's great. We've seen it several times. So, um, cool. yeah, with that in mind, I think Connor will, will kind of dive in a little bit, and we'll just sort of ping-pong back and forth. Sure. Um, and if you need to duck out at any point, just kind of let us know. And no, and, no, yeah, no. We'll I, I, you got me for what? What do you have me for? Like an hour? Yeah, we we kind of have an out at eight or so. But sure, uh, but let's yeah, do it. As long as you're willing to talk to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fine. All right. Thank you so much, man. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I'll let you take it away, Connor. Okay. Well, the first thing that we really want to know about you, Mark, is we just want to kind of get a little bit of background on how you grew up. Specifically, sure. if you went to college and uh, <laughs> if you did, what did you study while you were there? Uh, well, I'm older, so uh, what we studied back in the late 80s really wasn't relevant to anything because we didn't remember. I, I was like one of the only people uh, in my campus that even had a computer at home, and it was like an Apple II GS, and that was like state-of-the-art back then. Um, right, yeah. But, but yeah, so real quick, so I went to Washington State University when I was really young. I, I skipped a few grades and probably shouldn't have gone when I was so young. I wasn't even nearly, the, the drinking age there I think was 18. I wasn't even old enough to, to drink at that age. And uh, so, I, so I basically asked people to buy me alcohol and then I drank my first year away. And then transferred over to, yeah, I transferred over to Western Washington University and studied a lot of business administration, stuff like that. I mean, again, there wasn't that much to study. This was back when, when uh, universities were cheap. I mean, you could pay for semesters with couch cushion money. Um, and I studied uh, just a broad spectrum of things, nothing, nothing special. But then I was kicked out my junior year for manufacturing explosives on campus. So You're that, kidding. yeah, it's a whole nother story. If you want to look into it, there's a, a show or a little thing on YouTube. It's called Fireworks. It's literally the first radio show I ever did. I called it Fireworks because I didn't want people to look it up and say, oh my God, he's a criminal. No, I made, I made right. fireworks right. for the, uh, the Native American reservations that are around this area up in the Seattle area. Anyway, so that's what, that's what I studied. And uh, it was anything, anything, wasn't anything super cool. Um, and then... I went to, um, I, was, I was a sous chef for three years and at a Mediterranean restaurant uh, on Whidbey. And then after I got nailed for the, the fireworks thing, I was teaching, I was, I was working as a, a teacher's assistant at, at a computer lab, teaching kids about computers and played a video game tournament, a worldwide com uh, video game tournament for computer pinball and won the tournament back in 94. And the company, the production company hired me out of Boulder, Colorado, and I went over there and then I taught proprietary software for 20 years. Uh, I, I played video games for the first three years, played video games for a living and then transitioned over to, uh, there's a lot of tech companies in the 90s in, in Boulder then. And did that for 20 years and never got married, never had kids, never had time for whatever reason. And then during that whole time, I kind of dabbled in conspiracies. I was kind of, you know, kind of, I, if you don't get married or have kids, you have a lot of free time in your hands. And sure. that's what I did. I looked at just about every conspiracy you could think of. And then I said, okay, I'll look at flat earth, cross it off my bucket list. And that was four years ago. And now like, I, like I'm heading off to, in two days, I'm heading off to Australia to shoot a television commercial. Uh, the first flat earth endorsement of a deal. And it's like, okay, wow. <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> hey, one of these days I may have to get an agent. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. 
So anyway, that's that's sort of a, a my background in a really abbreviated form. Excellent. And yeah. thanks for, you know, just kind of transitioning right into, you know, your experience with conspiracy theories and obviously specifically flat earth. I right. was wondering if there was a specific, you know, aha moment when you were researching these different conspiracy theories theories that really kick-started your involvement in, in Flat Earth? Uh, no, no. As a matter of fact, any good conspiracy person hates Flat Earth. I mean, most people hate it anyway, because we're, it's, it's the only conspiracy we teach to children, we debunk to children. Which is, oh yeah, by the way, right. I mean, we, don't, we don't teach anything else to kids in the, the conspiracy world except for Flat Earth, and it's so obvious. It's like, well, we used to think it's flat, now we think it's a globe, and that's how it is. And every other conspiracy I looked at, I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding you that when I did the Flat Earth Clues, I, I wasn't kidding when I said I had friends who actually believe the entire royal family is made out of lizard people. And yet when I right. say, I say, yeah, but what about flat earth? And they go, get the hell out of here. It's like, what? <laughs> you just told me about lizard people and you're going to shoot me down like I'm insane. And that's, that is the, the flat earth stigma. And so no, no flat earth or no other conspiracy tied to flat earth. It, but once you get into it, everything else is under the flat earth umbrella. Everything else really right. dove, dovetails into it quite nicely. So there was no aha moment. Um, now there was an aha moment when I was researching flat earth that really was the, the tipping point for me. And that was, um, that was Antarctica. When I was looking yeah. at like, like the details of the Antarctic Treaty, when I, I you know, I, I've looked at a lot, I, I'm not necessarily a history fan, but I, cause I, I, you know, history is just lies that are agreed upon by the winners. And when I was looking at, at Antarctica, I realized that the, you know, when, when Admiral Byrd came back and he, and he found all these resources, you know, the Americans and the Soviet Union, you know, they tons of resources down there. And we all know, you know, our civilization is based on greed and money and power. And yet, we're not only we are not allowed to go down there, we're not even allowed to talk about it. And that part was like, I, I just had to call BS. It was like, there is no freaking way we would do it. it goes, it's, it's a plot hole. If you believe in, in how stories are told. It's, it's a major plot hole, which is like, look, people, you could, you could, there are people that will, could frack in your, go do fracking in your backyard tomorrow. Literally, it could make that happen. And yet you're telling me that no country is allowed to even talk about Antarctica as a resource gathering. It's like, oh no, 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 right. no, no. Anyway, so that was the tipping point for me. And everything I looked at pointed at the same thing. In fact, when I was making the clues real quick, when I was making the clues, I told myself that if any clue that I made pointed in a different direction like with a completely alternative like well maybe not be flat earth maybe this then i was just going to hang the whole thing up in fact the right. when i made the clues i just put it i put my name and my phone number out there hoping that somebody would just blow it out of the water so i could get back to my normal life and and the exact th opposite thing happened where just people kept calling and calling and calling and saying yeah you might be onto something and here's why i was like oh man this is not going to end well so yeah and here we are do you, you kind of fell down a rabbit hole, so to speak, just kind of just kind of looking into this stuff. And then yeah. you thought, wait a minute, some of this kind of holds water a little bit. So yeah, so to speak. I, yeah, you, you're absolutely we, right. It, it, it started out as a rabbit hole. And, and everybody, I'm not kidding, the power of this topic. And here's the, the T-shirt reads, I became a flat earther because I tried to debunk it. That's, right. that's how everybody gets. Everybody tries to shoot it down. In fact, the, the quote I have nowadays is like, I wake up every day trying to shut down Flat Earth and every day I fail. Even today, I was like, look, yeah. please, somebody show me something that can just sink it. And they can't. Right. And we just, it's kind of like the um, La Brea tar pits. If you know, you know that area out in Los Angeles where, you know, the, the tar pits where animals would fall in and then either prey or family would try to help them or eat them and they'd fall in. And it just keeps, you know, it's this nonstop thing to yeah. where... Yeah. Um, there was uh, a thing and I'm, I'm putting it in my book and I don't mind saying it at this point because I don't care. Like I put a thing about um, uh, how Amy Adams hates flat earth. You, you won't see this in the news. I, I found out through another celebrity. Amy Adams hates flat earth. And during her thing, when she was trying to shut down flat earth during a party after the Oscars, she was converting people because she was trying to kill it. She was just like, she's like, let me tell you why I hate flat earth. And she goes into this and people are like looking it up going, hey, this is really interesting. Because if you're passionate about something, whether you love it or you hate it, you're going to generate interest. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's kind of how we like became so interested in it in you and sort of the community at large, because we just kind of see how passionate you guys are about this. 
so you you started making videos. Correct me if I'm wrong. Around the beginning of 2015. Yep. I so watched a good handful of them. And kind of how long did it take before it they sort of took off or or? Oh, it was, it was immediate. It was immediate. In fact, I I made the first video on February 10th, and by the time I got to video eight. And I was doing one a day because I was like, okay, I'm just going to get this out of my system. I'm going to hit as many as I can. By the time I got to Clue 8, people were calling me. And then right. by the time, I think within a month after that, I had like in an interview like almost immediately. Yeah, a month almost to the day, I had my first interview. And then the interviews really just didn't stop. Um, like Coast to Coast called me. Uh, within two or three, I think not even three months. And apparently that's, people are like asking me, it's like, how many times did you have to solicit coast to coast? I'm going, what are you talking about? <laughs> like their producer just called me out of the blue and she was, and it was the weirdest conversation. She was saying, uh, she goes, okay, what's your DVD? And I go, I don't have a DVD. She goes, what's your book? I go, I don't have a book. She goes, all right, what's your website? I go, look, I've only been doing this for three months. And, and she goes, she, she could hear the sigh on the other end. She goes, why am I talking to you? And I go, I go, you called me. I go, tell me. And she goes, all right, give me the nickel tour. And I gave her the nickel tour. And the next week I was on the show and it just snowball, right. snowballed from then, from there. So it's amazing how, how much that can pick up so quickly. Oh yeah. My one question, my one question for you, just to, just to kind of get a sense of how you get your information. Right. I was wondering, do you trust? any of the major news outlets as source as credible sources of information or do you just try and avoid that altogether no 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 i think i think all mainstream sources have some truth in it but you have to be able to look at it and not take it at, at face value uh the, the quote is trust everyone but count your change which is like, look, I mean, look, we all know full well that you can buy news stories nowadays. It's, it's not hard. Every time you see a story about, I don't know, eating three ounces of chocolate per week can lower your blood pressure or <laughs> now eggs are good for you. Where do you think these studies came from exactly? You know, these are, these are purchase studies. It's not like the, the news people, objective journalism, I, I think has been dead for a long time. Uh, it's, or if it ever completely existed. And that is back in the day, let's put it this way when uh, there's there's a wonderful story uh or the movie citizen kane if you remember that where the, yeah. the whole the whole point was it's like well if you're really really rich and a newspaper is talking bad about you just buy the newspaper and then you can make then you can say right. anything say anything you want so uh I, I i trust some stuff but i i basically look at it and say okay if there is an ulterior motive for the story, what is it? In fact, that's one of one of the things I pride myself on is looking at the other side of the chessboard. I don't care that the moves are necessarily being made. I want to know why they made them. And to where I'm, I'm even, there's even a lot of conspiracies out there to where I'll look and say, okay, I understand it looks from, from a distance. It looks like it's evil, but they're, they're, I'm not going to say I'm a huge believer in the greater good, but there's a lot of things that happen that are for the greater good. And they're just right. decisions that the average person, sorry, you're just, it's, it's above your pay grade to make it. And it's like, so, but at the same time, look, uh, are there black hats twirling handlebar mustaches? Sure. Of course there are. We all know that. So there you go. Right. So you're able to take the information, put it through your own lens of skepticism oh, and yeah. come out with come out with what you believe. To be yeah. True. And again, remember what, yeah. Like, so every day I will scan, uh, CNN, Fox, NBC, and Russia Today. Those are the four I'll look at. And just just scan for just general stories to see what the hell's out there. And then I'll do a search in Google for anything Flat Earth related in the news. And then I'll search YouTube for anything Flat Earth related, you know, in the last 24 hours. Most of my searches are, you know, 24 hours old. And then just kind of see where, you know, what are what the other side of the chessboard's doing. Right, right. Well, let's go ahead. Let's talk about the uh, the movement, the flat Earth movement yeah. at large. So, the past few years, I would say even the average person can tell or has likely noticed how much the movement has grown. Right. I was wondering what you believe to be the catalyst for that. Do you feel that you're the driving force behind that, or was there something else? Well, I'm never going to be egotistical enough to say that I was the driving force. 
Um, because Flat Earth was, I didn't invent Flat Earth. I didn't even invent Flat Earth 2.0, which is what we kind of call it now. You know, if, if all, everything sure. Flat Earth before 2015 was 1.0, this is 2.0. Um, what, what, the reason why it caught on is because we, with the help of me, I mean, I, I, I will say I was the first person to make the, the Flat Earth 101 guide, you know, the dummies guide for Flat Earth. But we've now created a Flat Earth model that is far easier to understand than the globe model. And that's powerful for a lot of people. You know, people are, are very visual and they're very tactile. And if all of a sudden you, I mean, you try to explain a globe and the solar system to somebody, you need, well, and geometry and trig and calculus and some quantum mechanics and stuff like that. Most people can't even remember high school algebra, including me. So, and then you, you come and say, oh yeah, by the way, or it could be a snow globe. And here's how the snow globe model works, works just as well as the globe model. In fact, even better in some circumstances. What do you think of that? And people are like, yeah, yeah, sure. Let's go with that. Because people, I, I, I'm going to use the, um, the, uh, the art of war reference. And the nice version is that uh, people are like water. They always take the path of least resistance. Uh, the not nice version is that people are lazy. Okay, especially especially human beings you know i mean animals in general are kind of lazy but except for insects but but people are really really lazy and so it's like oh yeah if the flat earth model makes sense to them yeah they're, they're going with that and why not uh so yeah that's that's really why it's caught on i mean it's something in fact i talked about this in the in the book that i'm making right now which is it's kind of jumped from the internet to become kind of like a campfire story whereas you can tell people about flat earth without using the internet now, granted, they'll have to do some reference checking and, and you know, do you know, some searching on their own in the Internet. But you can tell them about it just standing on a street corner. And that's tough to do with other things. In fact, you can't do it with the globe. So that's in my opinion. That's why it's that's why it's resonated so so quickly. Right. And, you know, Mark, you're a humble guy, but I'm not afraid to say, it. like, I think you had a big part of this. And I think what you're saying about sort of the solar system and, you know, like, talking about the science and stuff people get inundated with like geometry and physics and their eyes kind of start to glaze over but what i found sort of compelling about your videos was you kind of come at it from like a narrative perspective right you're sort of telling a story and i think that is what people kind of latch on to quickly and find so attractive because when you just throw like you know numbers and math at people it is overwhelming but when you come at it from like a you know, you're, you're kind of crafting a narrative. I think that's when you kind of get people listening a little bit. Yeah, you, you got a point there, which is, and, and thank you for that. But the, the narrative that I threw out there, yeah, what I, what I made it different, because, and part of it was my training. When I was doing the proprietary software training, I was teaching people how to understand some pretty complex time and attendance software. And I was explaining it to like blue collar factory uh, employees. And when I was doing that, you know, when you do that repetitive, re redundantly, uh, I wasn't going to say repetitively because it's going to tongue tie. But when like, you do that enough times, you realize how you can boil down concepts to people. And so when I made the video, I really thought of the lowest common denominator. And that is just anybody walking on the street. And so I use like literally no math. And what you were saying there, you're absolutely right about uh, the people, how they get glazed over. In fact, the, the curvature of the Earth formula is the perfect example. So if I tell people the curvature of the Earth is eight inches per mile, and they're looking at me and they're going, I'm totally with you, eight inches per mile. And I go squared. And then they just glaze right. over. And they're like, oh, my God, I, I like in junior high, I thought I learned this and I didn't. I was looking at some girl. And it's like, yep, that's exactly what happened. Uh, and that was well, the same. Uh, yeah, nobody, nobody remembers that. And, it, and so, yeah, in the clues, I used no math. And I just told a story and connected the dots. And I said, here's, yeah, basically, like, here's a story. So, Gather around, children. Let me tell you about the flat right. earth. <laughs> and uh, right. so thank you for that, though. And so, like, to zoom out a little bit, like, why do you think the government is trying to, like, cover this up? And what do you think they kind of like gain to convince the public of this? And then furthermore, like, you know, considering we're in a modern world that's so like rich with war and conflict and struggles globally, like how are all these nations, you think, able to keep such a united front on on this, you know, big truth? Like how, how does how, yeah, how do you keep how do you keep such a big secret? OK, two two things. Exactly. One, uh, one is the why. Yeah, asked a pretty big question there. Um, one is the why. The why is easy, and that is civilization was already built before the powers that be figured it out for themselves. Meaning our best and brightest 
even the governments didn't know for sure until about 1960. And by then, we had already had the industrialized nations, you know, rise. So they were just protecting their own. Basically, it's like, OK, right. we pot potentially could be putting civilization at risk in 1960 if we go ahead and tell this to the public. And I mean, we're talking academically, economically, religiously. I mean, that's a short meeting. It's like, oh, what's the worst that could happen? It's like, oh, I don't know. People walking through the streets with pitchforks and torches burn the whole place down. Yeah, that, that could actually happen because then also you're putting science absolutely on its heels because it's like, oh, OK, you were wrong about something really, really important. What about that other stuff like the Big Bang Theory and evolution and carbon dating and dark matter and so on and so on? It would never end. Right. Um, as far as the who and, you know, how many people would have to keep this a secret? The good news about or the good thing about Flat Earth is that it's so huge that hardly anyone has to be let in on it. I mean, it is a, a, the ultimate need to know. So, yeah, I mean, like, for example, everybody that works at a space program doesn't have to know. Only the telemetry guys, uh, which is why I referenced the movie Capricorn 1. And that is only right. the telemetry guys need to know. The rest of them, just let them do their job. I mean, does the president know? Probably not. Does Neil deGrasse Tyson know? Probably not. You know, they might, they might have a hint of it, but they're not going to get the briefing. They're not going to get the full briefing because I think the Apollo astronauts got the full briefing and that's why they turned into freaking basket cases and started drinking the rest of their lives and, you know, turning into recluses. So at the highest levels, yes. Are there people with bank accounts with so many numbers that it's worthless even counting? Yeah, those guys probably know. Um, are there kings and queens or princes or whatever that, that know? Yeah, probably. Um, but we're not going to know who the ultimate people are because the first rule of power uh, has never changed, which is stay hidden. Uh, the, the longer version of that is never put yourself in a position of, that you can be overthrown. That's true. Sure. Power. And so, no, you do millions of people. know? Nope. Nope. Do thousands of people know? Yeah, probably. But thousands is nothing right. in the in uh, the grand scheme of things. You know, we're talking about seven billion people. Right. So are you now feel free to, you know, express your uh, your Fifth Amendment here, but. Yeah. Who is the most prominent person that you've ever had a conversation with about Flat Earth? Uh, we're talking about uh, just celebrity, like A-lister? Yeah, I would say... Or, or scientists, like a Neil deGrasse Tyson. Oh, uh, okay. Like anyone the um, I, can, I can tell you this, and unfortunately I'm not going to out this particular celebrity because he's, he's got to out himself. Um, sure. I went, the, the person that told me about Amy Adams... Uh, told me that when he was at an Oscar party that uh, that Amy Adams was in there ranting about how much she hated Flat Earth. And he said that a lot of people in Hollywood know, in the entertainment industry, know about this. But they're all nervous about getting on the dance floor because, why? you know, they saw what happened to Kyrie Irving. Let's put it that way. Right, right. Ky Kyrie Irving, God bless him, you know, he did it out of, of overconfidence, which is, hey, I got my championship ring. I'm 25 years old. My best friend's LeBron James. <laughs> what are you going to do to me? Yeah, well, right. flash forward a year later when he's in Boston, not winning a title. And uh, what do you think? I mean, you got to remember the, the reporters now have this in their back pocket for every single interview and they play, what, 100 games a year? So it's it's a tough sled for him. He's now he's never officially retracted, but it's it's got to be tough. It's, I mean, the closest he got was the uh, the Forbes 30 under 30 thing where he was apologizing to all the, uh, the high school science teachers that were just getting just slaughtered because of him. And you can imagine, right? You're, you're in a you're in a high school and I don't know, Philadelphia an urban high school saying, oh yeah, the earth's round. And all of a sudden the kids in the back, like, yeah, my man, Kyrie, who makes, I don't know, a hundred times more than you do. Uh, he says it's flat. What do you got to say to that? <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's yeah. like he, he's got a shoe commercial. You got a shoe commercial. <laughs> it's like, and so, but anyway, no, I, I can't, I can't, unfortunately anybody in the, uh, I mean, I know big, I've, uh, captains of industry that are out there, uh, but they're not. No one's coming out until until it gets a little more. Uh, it's there's going to be a need need to be a mainstream. Palatable. Well, w I mean the documentary was one thing, and that really 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 helped. But there's going to have to be a mainstream television show before because uh, right. I mean before the documentary, for example, uh, people that interviewed you had to talk to flat earthers directly. Now the media can go after a movie which makes it a lot easier to do it because it's a degree of separation. So I, we'll see. We'll see. Anyway. Yeah. And so like 
talking about like as the community grows you know people have varying opinions on stuff and this is kind of outlined in the movie you talk about it like the different sort of factions within the flat earth community right you know some people think there's one uh dome some people think there's several yep. some people there's differences opinions on you know how it fits into the universe at large like what do you sort of ascribe to personally with regards to the dome and its, its kind of relation to the larger universe yeah yeah i ascribe to the majority which is i believe in basically the snow globe model or the shallow state okay. the shallow stadium model uh flat circular uh, with a dome over it, the dome's probably pretty shallow, so it's not as steep as a snow globe. Um, and that that snow globe is probably inside a big box, because if it's mechanical by nature or even digital, um, machines can't think in circles; they can only think in squares and and right angles. It's just something the machines do. I mean, look at pixels on a television; they're all squares. Um, right. So that, I mean, a machine cannot draw a circle; it has to draw tons and tons and tons of right angles. Um, but that being said, what I try to tell people is, can I prove to you right now that the Earth is flat? Prove to you. No. Can I create so much reasonable doubt in the globe that the only place left you have to turn is some sort of flat Earth model? Yes. And, re and people say, well, reasonable doubt's not enough. I go, oh, it is every day in court, in every courtroom, all day long. But because of that, that's why another reason why the flat Earth is so palatable, because... Every flat earther can say that will say the same thing. It's like, no, we don't know exactly what the model looks like. We're still working that out. But what we do know is it's not that globular thing over there, you know, with water on it. There's no way in hell it's that. Everybody agrees on that. And that's really, really powerful. So where, yeah, yeah, and we have factions. Sure. Sure. I mean, I, I get in disagreements, but we kind of agree to disagree. It's like, fine, dome versus sure. dome versus no dome, multiple continents outside, uh, you know, how deep is it? Where exactly are the sun and the moon? What exactly are the sun and the moon? So on and so on. Totally up for debate. But the, everybody's still at the same time. Again, which is why I kind of, um, kind of referred it to like the Scottish Highlands. The clans. Which is, you know, oh yeah, the clans hate each other, right? They, they fight all the time. Oh, at the end of the day, oh, they all hate the English. And that's the whole point. It's like, oh yeah, we'll join, we'll join together when we have to fight the English, which is why it's probably been good that science hasn't done some sort of organized front against us. I mean, if Neil deGrasse Tyson really wanted to campaign against us, oh, all that division within our, our camps would stop. It would just be over. It'd be like, good, we get a target. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the documentary. Sure. I know that you have uh, publicly stated before that you were not the biggest fan of Behind the Curve, but I wanted to see how you felt, if, if you felt that the documentary even somewhat accurately portrayed the movement. Generally, what were your thoughts? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, no, and believe it or not, I've been more of a supporter of the, the documentary than, than anything. I mean, what I said was, and I, and I still say this to this day, in fact, I said it on an interview earlier, which is like, look, the Flat Earth community hates it. The globalist community finds it really interesting. And that is because if you're in Flat Earth, you one, you don't like hearing dissenting voices. So when you look up on screen, you see Scott Kelly or a scientist or a psychiatrist or any of these other people going against Flat Earth. You're just looking at the screen going, oh, I hate them so much. Right. Even though you don't really hate them, you kind of hate them. Um, the other thing is, is that um, even though the documentary took some shots at us and I knew they were going to. Uh, it generated a huge amount of interest within just the average person on the street. And I know this because it got into so many film festivals that they were flying me out to the film festivals to, to like, you know, we, they, we couldn't even send enough people out. And I, I'm not even part of the production team. And they were just like, hey, Mark, can you go fly out to this film festival? And it's like, yeah. And I would sit in the audience and I would watch the audience reactions. And then I would go on stage and a answer questions. And. The, I mean, there was, the, I remember one particular audience, like almost nobody left they, because they told, told them in advance that I was going to be up there afterwards and they just all raised their hands and they all had questions. So for me, it became the ultimate Trojan horse. Now, that being said, would I change a few things? Sure. I'd change a few things. I, I wouldn't paint Bob right. in that light like Bob from Globusters was, was hiding something and I wouldn't take a shot at Jaren. Because Jaron, you know, now did he prep for those experiments very well? Nope, he did a terrible job. But at least he admitted to it. Um, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't have ended the movie on that note. I would have ended it on a slightly more upbeat note. But I knew sure. I knew why the producers did that, and I only knew this. In fact, the producers were very during the whole. We, it took us seven months to shoot it, and when we were done, um, you know, the different versions, like the iTunes version, there was a director's commentary on there, and they said when that twelve year old kid walked up to the microphone, that's when they had to take a stand against flat Earth, and I was like, really? It was like it was like for the for the children. You know, because it's like, oh, it's all fun and games until you start recruiting kids. And it's like, okay, first off, we're not recruiting anybody. It's not like we've got a, a special Flat Earth Children's program. We're not Joe Camel. But the but that really, boil, you know, really rubbed them the wrong way. And quite a few other people, too. There's like, well, that kid shouldn't have been there and you shouldn't have let him be there and talk to you. It's like, what? It's a, he can talk to anybody he wants. It's not like I'm going out to the schoolyards. Anyway, so, uh, but other than that, I thought it was, I thought it was fine. Would I change a few things? Sure. Uh, but in the end, uh, I think for the most part, it was a very fair look at Flat Earth in 2017. Excellent. So I did just want to ask you before we get into some of our uh, some of our questions that we had from a scientific perspective. Yeah. I wanted to know: Do you enjoy being the face of the Flat Earth movement? No. Would you still create videos and participate in the movement if you weren't? Um. I. I didn't. I did not want to be the face of Flat Earth at all. I, I was hoping, ironically enough, that Matt Boylan would do it. You know, the the guy who was named Math Powerland, because he was doing it before right. me. And every producer, sure. every producer wanted to talk to him. And he is really interesting to watch on camera. He's better looking than me. He's got a lot of stuff going for him. It's like, yeah, Matt, take point. And turns out Matt can't give a good interview to save his life. Literally could not. If his right. life was riding on the line, he'd die. He's just, he's just, uh, I can't even really yeah. describe him. Um, but, what is his kind of deal? Well, that's, we're sort of curious about that. Cause he's just, I mean, you're so kind of calm and collected about all of this stuff. And, and all of, I know it's, you know, it's a documentary and it's supposed to sort of sensationalize, like, things to make it seem interesting but he just seems so kind of angry and vindictive it seems like he was mad at you because he thought that you were stealing his life he missed he missed his window plain and simple i mean it was and they talked about it in the documentary it was it was not a lie i've got the emails to prove it i save all that stuff <laughs> whereas like it's literally the first people that called me wanted to get a hold of matt i was one of the first only people that had matt's phone number and and he was like he was literally waving me off going it's like no 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 interviews i'm not talking to the press it's like okay and then what do you think happens you call him back and they say well do you have anybody to talk to like, what do you want to talk about flat earth it's like sure i'll talk about it and then that was it and so yeah matt was bitter why wouldn't he be bitter i mean he it was but it was his mistake i didn't do anything he he was the one that uh, and by the t so yeah by the time and again the media is kind of lazy if you do decent interviews it's kind of like how bill nye got on all these shows right he's not a scientist right. he's got a bachelor's degree in, in mechanical and he's talking about climate change and the mars rover and quantum physics and it's like he has a bachelor's in mechanical he's an actor but he looks right. like, he looks like a scientist on television so in sure. in my case it was like okay fine i can give a decent interview um but that's all the media wants that's like good can you talk so, anyway so go ahead so i gotta ask with that in mind how much does warner brothers pay you <laughs> warner brothers i've been accused of so in fact they in the the deleted scenes of the documentary there's that line i actually gave a little a little rant on I had a sheet in front of me about all the things I've been accused of, of being a Sony exec, a Warner Brothers exec. Uh, I've worked for just about every government agency you can think of. I'm special ops. I'm on a contract basis, you know, for some alphabet group, blah, blah, blah. Um, no. No, in fact, not only, I don't even think there's any, I don't think there's any nefarious types in Flat Earth at all because we've got so much internal, internal, whoa, sorry. Whoa, you guys still there? Where did I leave off? Hey, sorry, I think we lost you for a sec. Uh, you did, and I'm uh, sorry. Were... I, I, what, when, what, what did you hear when I was talking? It was like a springing noise, almost, or something. I couldn't quite tell. Not All sure right. what happened, but you were in the middle of your uh, of <laughs> telling us how much Warner Brothers, Brothers pays. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah no, 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 no. It's yeah, Warner, Warner Brothers, and all the other things I've been accused of. Um, 
It's just, no, I mean, people, in fact, the, the running joke is, has been, except for, like, the commercial I'm going to do now, they say, oh, yeah, you got into Flat Earth to make money, and it's like, come on, nobody goes into Flat Earth to make money. As a matter of fact, it's still an uncharted, uncharted territory. So, right. um, it's, no, no, nobody's ever paid me for anything, and it's, it's I mean, it, like, like, for example, like, National Geographic, when they, they, they flew me out to the interview, but you can't pay an interviewee officially because it's a news right. thing. So right. now I'm I'm pretty. So about, go ahead. Sorry, I was just. What about like YouTube revenue? Is that something that? Oh yeah, yeah. YouTube YouTube's fine. As a matter of, well, funny thing. Uh, YouTube. I didn't even monetize my channel for the first six months. Didn't, right. didn't didn't allow thumbs up and thumbs down. And YouTube wrote me directly. Google wrote me and said, "Hey, you might want to think about monetizing your channel." And yeah. I know, of course, you know, if I make money, they make money because it's it's all connected. But right. uh, but yeah, I mean, it was like, okay, sure, I'll turn it on, and I turned it on, and and it, you know, keeps the lights on, sure. But it's um, it's but then they changed the rules recently, like in this year after the ad apocalypse, and now they're going after, uh, they're going to recommend conspiracy stuff less and less. And it's like, yeah, you know, but again, nightmare. nobody nobody goes in to thinking they're going to make money. Uh, to, to do it. Right. I mean, YouTube doesn't pay a ton and you know, there's so much competition out there. I mean, honestly, now YouTube is the, the biggest television network in the world and it's fierce. So whatever. Yeah. So if it's okay with you, I think we'd like to maybe talk a little bit about some of the scientific aspects that we're sure. curious about. Sure. 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 Um, Connor, I think you had something. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit about first off the, the standard, the standard flat earth model. Now I was just looking this up on Google and the one that kept coming back to me was the oriented picture of the, the North pole, um, your accepted North pole in right. the dead center of the map right. with the, with North America directly to the West, Eurasia directly to the East and Africa to the South. Right. That, am I looking at the right one? Yeah, yeah. You're probably looking. And the, the official name of this map is the azimuthal, equidistance so a z i m u t h a l space equidistant um which is the, basically the un flag if if anyone is listening and and wants to know what we're talking about here the un flag and the azimuthal equidistant map and the flat earth map are identical which again i found interesting when i was looking it up because out of all the map projections in the list of in the wiki list of map projections, the as of the, the AE map is what I call it. The AE map is is the only one with notes next to it, and I thought that was interesting. Everything else has like nothing, nothing remarkable at all, and yet this map is 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 really interesting. It's got a lot of different facets to it. But yeah, that that would be the the that's the basic map we start with. Okay, great. So my thinking here. So on a globe theory, on a regular globe theory, globe, uh -huh. the North Pole is due north so my thinking here a uh, compass's orientation would change depending on where you're standing in relation to the north pole right. so say you're in the arctic circle right and you're passing around the north pole your compass's orientation would change based on where you are in relation to the pole sure so on on this model there is actually much more land well water mostly it's pacific ocean that's directly north of your typical North Pole. And then of course you get to Australia, New, New Zealand, and then the Antarctic Rim. Right. So my question for you would be, would the, wouldn't the compass continue pointing north if you passed over the North Pole and kept going? It would be, the orientation wouldn't change. Would say, yeah, the, 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 the compass works almost identically on the flat map as it does on a globe which is interesting to me because in fact we we've been kind of we've done little cool experiments where you put a magnet you know in the center of the north and then you know a compass rolled around the outside now the difference so you could still circumnavigate the flat the flat world and come back to the same place and the compass wouldn't act any differently if you were just using the compass now of course the globalist will be the first to point out, it's like, well, yeah, but you're making a really slow left-hand turn or a slow right-hand turn, whereas on a globe, you're just kind of flying straight. But I go, well, kind of. If, if you're going, if you're just trying to, to do, you know, if you're trying to circle the globe, yes, you would be flying straight. But if you're just going, like, circling the northern hemisphere, technically you're making a slow left-hand turn or a slow right-hand turn. 
but yeah, magnetic for me, the, the mag, the magnetic forces part of it is exactly the same with the exception of the South pole, you know, because the South pole, and I thought that was really interesting because I've only learned, learned about this in the last couple of years is that the South, you know, because it should be a magnetic North and a magnetic South. And everybody I've, I have talked to that, that does their stuff down in the Southern hemisphere, they say there is no dominant magnetic South. It's always North. It never, it, the South never dominates. And I always thought that was strange to where there was a guy in, in he wasn't even one of ours. It was just some guy in on the coastline of Antarctica and kids were, it was like, kids ask such and such. And they were asking this guy, well, what does the compass do? And he goes, he goes, honestly, it really doesn't do anything. <laughs> and I thought that was interesting because in Antarctica, the compass should absolutely do something. You know, it should, it should just bury the needle South and it doesn't. So anyway, right. go, go ahead. So, uh, yeah, with that, you, you segue perfectly. I, I want to talk a little bit about, like, the kind of Antarctic Rim, which is, you know, in theory, the edge of this whole thing. And, like, what – do you do you think of, like, a certain portion of the Ar Antarctic Ring as being perhaps the most accessible to finding the edge? And, like, in the doc – or in, in some of the research I've done, it seems like there's, you know, barriers and whatnot. Like, if you were to go out there with a team – do you think there would be people like ready to stop you or is it just a matter of hopping a few fences? Like, no, 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 no. Because here's, here's what I think. I think, and, and it's the misconception and part of the, there's two things in the map, which we have to draw a certain way just because it's for, for convenience of use. Uh, one is of course the sun and the moon are way bigger than what we, we portray them as because I mean, if you look at the, most of our models, the sun and the moon would be about a thousand miles wide and we say it's less than 50 miles wide, but if you drew it less than 50 miles wide, you could barely even see it. They'd be just tiny, tiny, tiny. The other thing, of course, right. is the, the Antarctic coastline, meaning if Admiral Byrd, the being the Antarctic coastline is just the beginning of a much, much wider white area. So if he was flying planes with refueling stops for 30 years, trying to figure out where the outer marker was and basically gave up by 1954 and then in 1956, you know, everything changed. Then the outer marker, you know, the distance between the coastline of Antarctica and the outer marker would be several thousand miles at that point. So stretch that white area way, way further. We're talking about a dome that's much, much bigger than just a snow globe. But for ease of use and how we portray it, a snow globe is the easiest thing to, to get into people's heads. Gotcha. Um, and so, like, are you aware of, Connor O'Brady's expedition that happened in sort of the winter of last year. Yeah, yeah, where he supposedly hauled that 300 and something pound sled. Yeah, I, I heard it. What are your thoughts on all that? Where um, he kind of he he crossed the Antarctic kind of continent. Well, kinda. I mean, if you look if you look at his route, first off, he he chose you know if you look at the Antarctic co continent how they display it, he chose the skinniest part you could possibly use. And, yeah, but, I, I saw that. Yeah, the route. But if you portrayed it on a flat map, it would just be he kind of did like a half circle around part of the coastline. He didn't really go anywhere. Plus, and I don't think he was in on it. Is when he was like, "Well, was he on it?" No, he didn't have to be on it. Because remember, here's here's the genius about what you know what we did when we tried to cover this thing up. You know, the GPS system that's United States Department of Defense all the way. You know, we built that, and so not only does it tell you where you want to go. It'll also tell you where they want you to go. So as right. far as like if you're going to see your buddy down in, I don't know, Tennessee. Oh, yeah, it'll get you there. But if you want to go to a certain place in Antarctica and if I was running the GPS system, I could steer you anywhere I wanted to. And what are you going to do? You don't know any different. It's like, oh, it tells me to go here. I mean, how many times right. have you been with your friend? And it's like, who's who's running the GPS? It's like, it's not here. It's like, I'm telling you, man. And he's looking at the GPS screen like it's gospel. <laughs> it's like, there's nothing there. Yeah. So people believe, I uh, hate to say it, but people believe the world that is presented to them. Right. Yeah. So you're saying um, that since Colin O'Brady did not actually traverse the entire Antarctic continent, continent, that there is still plenty of space. Oh, that yeah. Has yet to be explored yep, did he yep, just yep. kind of walk along the coast or? yeah yeah he walked inland and then kind of skirted the coast and then came back down another part of the coast and but right. remember it's so it's so antarctic is so easy to trick people with because there's no indigenous animal life no plant life the whole thing sits at about fourteen thousand feet most people know that it is a really really strange continent it doesn't make sense and it's it's like completely out of place with every other continent i mean 
most of the continents we have are really low altitude by comparison. And this one, most of it's in the nosebleed seats. So, I, again, he's he's fine. You know, it, it's a good propaganda piece, but doesn't doesn't convince us. I know that. And and the scientists that are kind of set up there and, and you know, running experiments. Yep. Do you think they're in on it? Nope. They know? Nope. They nope. Know? Nope. They don't they don't know anything. I mean, remember, it's the military and scientists that are allowed by the military. And some of them, I, do some of them know? Yeah, maybe. But you don't have to tell them. I mean, that's that's the whole point. It's like, okay, keep that thing as sparse as possible. Tell as few people as possible. Because everybody they seem to tell has a difficult time. It's 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 a tough thing to absorb. I mean, I mean again, look at, if anyone has any doubt, look at the, um, the Apollo astronauts after Apollo 11 during that international press conference. Those guys were... I've seen it, yeah. They were a train wreck. It's like what? What they the hell? Really I, they they should have been jacked up like they were on coke forever, and it's like yeah, we made it back and we didn't die. It's like no, these guys. It's like why were you so sad? It's like oh, that's why because you had a, a ticker tape parade and you didn't do anything. That's why. Well, they say Neil was kind of a recluse a little bit. Recluse? <laughs> he didn't interview anybody. He, he he he. And then just before he died, he he had that Bill Clinton thing where he comes on and says that cryptic speech where he says that, where he's addressing some of the new NASA people and he's saying, you know, there's much to learn and much to discover if you can uncover one of truth's hidden protective layers. What the hell was that all about? I mean, look that up yeah. if you get a chance. It's like, what are you... And I'm sure it's like... Like, even Bill Clinton at the time was probably... Didn't know what the hell he was saying. But I bet someone in the back, back row was looking at him going, oh, you better shut up. So, anyway. Do you think... By chance, and I, I'm just wondering about your thoughts on this. Do you think that their, you know, sullen attitude once they got back could have had possibly anything to do with post-traumatic stress? Nah, it's that's that's actually not bad. You're the first person to propose that. No, I I don't think so. I think it was mostly again the Capricorn One scenario. If if you get, I know I'm older and I watch that movie, but that is if you, because I do believe that their training process, I do believe that the movie, the right stuff, that was absolutely legit. They signed on to be heroes. They were military. They were the best of the best, and they were going to be heroes. And then the next thing you know, they were they were pulled aside and says, "Okay, you're not going. You got to fake this. Here's why." And then they realized after those guys, it's like, okay, all we have to do is tell them, like nowadays, the astronauts, it's like, you can tell them that you're going to fake something, but you don't have to tell them why. It's not in their pay grade anymore. So it's like, right. all right. So anyway, go ahead. And so obviously you think the moon landing is staged. Would you mind just kind of giving us a little bit of like the nickel tour of that? Sure. The kind Apollo, or everything, well, it's worse than you know. <laughs> everything about NASA was absolutely fabricated since minute one. Meaning when they try to bust through this thing, the bust through the dome in, in um, 1958, that's when NASA was founded. They used megaton weapons and then it was like, okay, they had to militarize space. They had to keep the private corporations away from space. So they went to the moon a whole bunch of times in rapid succession, six times in three years. No, it's unbelievable. And so, and, and the photographs and the movies have aged really, really badly. And flat earth has nothing really to do with this. Um, People have been questioning the moon, people have been questioning the moon landing since they stopped in 1972. But like like sure. there's like a single photo I could show you of Apollo 12. Um, you when you look at it, I mean just a random photo. It's like okay, fine, no stars in the background. You say that's an exposure setting. Fine, I'll give you that one. Even though you should have had at least a, a, one roll of film with a new exposure setting, but that's fine. Uh, how about all the, the shadows that are intersecting, even though there's only one light source, which is the sun, that's impossible. Uh, no blast crater, it's a 10,000 foot-pounds of, of thrust from that engine. There's there's no splay pattern at all, it was like the thing was just set on the ground, not to mention the capsule looked like it was built by a homeless tweaker. Um, the the spacesuit didn't make any damn sense because it defies the law of thermodynamics, and that is pressure needs a container. That spacesuit should all the spacesuits should have turned into parade floats, and they should have just not been able to move their arms or legs, and they were perfectly articulate, including their hands. Um, the, the the satellite dish with a VHS transmitter with a battery power in 1969. If you were lucky, if you were lucky, has a range of 50 miles, and yet and and that's if you're shooting like Morse code, right? <laughs> And yet they were shooting 10 frames of full video a second uh, with uh, with sound in color 
and communications and two-way communications over a quarter of a million miles through the Van Allen belts with pinpoint accuracy? No, 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 no. It was, there's so many things wrong with, with Apollo and the moon missions, is why, which is why they wrapped it up in 1972. It's like they knew right. that down the road is like, thank God, I mean, because the internet, well, which is why they can't fake any moon missions now. You can't do it. Yeah. The, the, I mean, we've got, we've got nerds at three o'clock in the morning in, the, in their underwear in Nebraska that find every single mistake in every movie and television show ever. So yeah. you're not going to be able to do it. You can't fake it. In fact, I, I joked, I said, if they offered me a dump truck full of money to produce the new moon landings, I'd turn them down without even hesitating. It's like, no. I mean, hell, Lord of the Rings had a, the first cut of Lord of the Rings had a car driving through the Shire in the background and everybody missed it. It's like, come on, right. it, it will so, get caught. So they're, they're terrified of doing a moon mission. They just talk about moon missions. We're going back. We're going back. No, you're not. No one's ever going back. Sorry. Do you think it was Stanley Kubrick? I think he helped design the, um, well, the, the wonderful documentary Room 237. It's great. I recommend it. Yeah. But, yeah, we've yeah. seen it. Um, but I think he helped. I think he helped a lot. I think they came to him and said, look, what can you fake? Tell us what you can fake on film when it comes to space. We'll give you an unlimited budget. In fact, they built him the world's most expensive camera lens at the time. And they gave him five years to shoot it. Tell me what studio allows a director five years to shoot any movie with, with that sort of budget. And when he was, but I think it soured him after a while, you know, create government and creative types don't mix. And I think after a while, he's like, no, you know, and, and they even allowed him to use those footage techniques to make 2001 A Space Odyssey, which he released one year before Apollo, which has aged extremely well. So if anyone has any doubts what you can fake on film, look at look the Blu-ray version of 2001. It's it's absolutely yeah. it's gorgeous. Um, I got a, a recommendation for you. You, you got to check out the movie Operation Avalanche. Um, I'm not sure if you, it's a. Uh, a Sundance film that came out a few years ago, and it, it's sort of a, a mockumentary about the faking of the moon landing. Was that with one of the kids Kubrick from Harry well. Potter? Uh, no, it's made by a Canadian filmmaker named Matt Johnson. Okay, I'll check it out. But, yeah, it's 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 pretty. It sort of posits a way in, in which it could have happened. But um, oh yeah, I'm gonna let Connor. Connor it's absolutely that absolutely thing. doable. We can fake anything now. However, can we do it absolutely 100 percent accurately? Not so much. Right. Right. In your first video, I know you mentioned, I, I believe it's your first video at least, you mentioned that there were no real accurate portrayals in film about the any of the Apollo missions. Right. I was just wondering, what were your thoughts on the movie First Man? <laughs> well, first of all, they had to. That, that movie was obligatory. You had to make at least one movie about the Apollo missions, but there was almost no fanfare behind it. So it was mostly, and I knew I knew when I saw the trailer, it's like, oh, okay, I see what you're going to do here. It's going to be the big buy. It's basically a, a one-man version of the right stuff. Um, but they also, it, how they produced it was really interesting because it was a Canadian director. Um, the lead was Canadian, and they pretty much removed the American flag from the moon. And in the articles, they called it, uh, well, a human achievement. And I was the first one to jump on. It's like, no, 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 no. If anyone should get credit for faking the moon landing, it should be the Americans. Don't don't. Right. But but yeah, again, it was interesting that in the history of civilization, you know, the greatest thing we ever did and Hollywood makes movies about everything. They never made a freaking moon movie. And so, yeah, the first man, I mean, the anniversary is uh, in two days officially. And, you know, there's not I mean, I'm sure there'll be a little media coverage on the 20th, but it should be huge because we should be on the moon right now. There should be hotels. There should be a colony. Uh, pr pr I know you're going to run out of time eventually, but I got to get this in. And that is you got to remember in the 1970s, we actually had a television show called Space 1999, where we had a full blown colony on the moon. Right. And it was absolutely considered a, like a like a pre future thing. It's like, OK, 20 years from now, why wouldn't we? Right. And that was in 1999. Right. It's 2019. We got nothing. Nobody's been back. Nobody goes. Nobody. I mean, uh, there's a little stories like China supposedly has had a rover on there for three years. They never send back images. Uh, Israel, a couple months ago, supposedly crashed, crashed a probe on the moon. No images. I uh, mean, they're, they're doing everything they can to say we're going without giving anything, you know, you know, anything concrete. So, oh, it drives me nuts. Right. I, you know, actually, we got a little. We can go till about eight fifteen or so. Okay. But real quick, do you do you believe we'll have to keep you all night? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. 
Do you believe, like, is the International Space Station real for your money? Oh, or... my God. No, 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 no. In fact, the International Space Station, we were the ones that really put the light on that thing. Because all of a sudden, we started looking at the International Space Station. We assumed guilt first, which is, okay, if it's a production, let's look at the production values. And one of the first things people jumped on was, and do, okay, first off, do I think there's something up there, flying up there, called the ISS? Sure. Why not? There's something flying up there. Absolutely. Um, do I think there's people on it? No way in hell. Not not a, not a chance. And this is because the interior shots are horrendously bad. I mean, even from a B a B list director, a B list production team, wouldn't be able to do this stuff. First thing you want to look at is oh, I don't know. Uh, look up ISS hairspray. That's a brilliant one because women's hair should act like a swimming pool, and they permed it. They permed all their freaking hair. In fact, out of all the choices, if you were going to do something with a woman with long hair, uh, the the first thing, okay, tie the hair back. Two, put a nice little NASA cap or any other of your favorite baseball caps on. Uh, three, this is probably the, the easiest one. Why does anyone have hair at all on the ISS? With the air filtration systems, the last thing you would have is body hair. Everyone would be shaved, but that's too weird, and that would freak people out. So you're going to put hair on people. It's like okay, fine, and and people buy it. And so, but yeah, they perm their hair straight up. Uh, other things would be why they don't open and shut the doors, <laughs> ever. Uh, you know, things should be like a submarine. Remember, you're in a in a pure vacuum up there, and yet the, the there's doors. You know, when you open, you know, when you're a submarine, when you close, get behind you, you close and crank the handle because you want to make sure if there's any sort of damage. I mean, ev all the doors are open all the time. If a if a micrometeor the size of a nickel punch through that thing they'd be all dead instantly and it's not like it is in the movies I, I have to stress to people it's like look look up something called a uh, vacuum versus steel rail car the, the power of a vacuum absolutely overshadows everything it overshadows gravity <laughs> it overshadows everything you can think of and it's instantaneous meaning if you even uh, even the tiniest hole it wouldn't be like in the movies like you know you hear this it's like, oh, we've got to close it. Somebody get some tape. No, it's instantaneous. I mean, the, the lungs in the compartment, the you know, I'm sorry, the, the air in the compartment, the air in your lungs, everything goes out. Everyone would be dead instantly. And they never, ever talk about that. Ever, ever, ever. Oh, and plus, I'm sorry, how in the world does a plastic and aluminum shell survive in a pure vacuum? It can't look up, look up steel rail car. We apply a, a vacuum field to a steel rail car. It crushes instantly. And yet we're expected to believe aluminum and plastic can survive a pure vacuum. No, 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 no. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, how about little other things? There's no machine shop up there, even though they should have exact tolerances for all their parts. Uh, no one would ever explained to me, you know, what they're breathing, what the atmosphere co content is up there. Cause it should be mostly nitrogen. And it's like, okay, how do you get the nitrogen up there? How how you how are you transporting huge amounts of nitrogen? Nobody talks about that. Uh, okay, go on and on and on. It's just no. The ISS is an absolute joke. And even though and even though I say that, people will say, well, okay. People have actually agreed with me. It's like, okay, fine. The moon missions are fake, but the ISS. I still believe in the ISS. And I say, well, do you you never into crime? This is like one of the first rules of crime, and that is if you if you have to lie about one thing, you might as well lie about everything, because the punishment's going to be the same. Kill one person, you might as well kill them all. And that is, if you lied about Apollo, <laughs> being being truthful about the ISS would help you none. Sorry, there's my rant. Right. Right. So I assume you feel similarly about the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, God. Like, what do you think those high-quality images of planets, quote-unquote, distant galaxies, are those just projections? They're not even, they're not even projections. They're just, they're not even, they're not even taking pictures of these things. Like, they're just, they're rendering their own images. It's Photoshop at its best. The galaxy, in fact, NASA's been really open about that. They say when they're taking pictures of galaxies, they, they, you can, you can watch this. This is not a secret where they say, oh, they're just, they just take pictures of dots and then they send it to an art department and they tell them what to draw. And they can draw it really, really well. Everyone, wonder, everyone wondered why the pictures have gotten so much better over the years and how we've gotten so many more of them. It's because they're, they've got, I mean, nowadays you can photo, I mean, and, come on, it's the internet. Everything can be photoshopped. Right. So you think they're using Photoshop, not like Microsoft Paint or anything like that? Well, you know, I don't know, might be using Paint. 
I know it's 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 really really easy to do. No image, no civilian images. Everyone, yeah, you can take pictures of of Jupiter from the ground, sure, but they're all fuzzy. The only people, it, it's not to say that it's suspicious, but you might want to raise an eyebrow or two, which is it. It's funny that all the great pictures of the planets are taken by the military. And NASA is military. Don't no one can ever tell me any different. It is absolutely Department of Defense all the way. It, not only is it military, it's uniquely military. It was founded on missile technology, and it was founded by the the scientist you know that they recruited from the still burning embers of the Nazi war machine. Without without the Nazi you know scientists, the, you know those guys, NASA doesn't even exist. I mean, for God's sakes, the founder was Werner von Braun. Oh. Right. So pivoting a little bit, like, do you think that there's like government manufactured infrastructure and machinery that is kind of like helping to project the appearance of a globe model, like like magnetic pole devices or, you know, nothing, nothing that we that nothing that we there? did. If there is technology out. OK, it's a good question. A human. First off, I got to say human beings, our civilization has nothing to do with with the manufacture and upkeep of this place. The only thing we did was keep the secret from our own people. When it comes to the technology that's that's doing whatever projection systems or whatever magnetics or, you know, uh, the molten stuff or anything along the, the weather machines, all that stuff, that is done by whoever built the place. Uh, I use the line from uh, Contact, which I think is very humbling where if you remember what she was asking she's going did you build it he goes we didn't build it we don't know who did right and it's like yeah. okay <laughs> you know a whole nother layer and so, so like the sun and the moon are those just lights you think are they actually you know gaseous like stars or do, no do know? i do i think the sun is just basically a light bulb now the question is is it a light bulb or is it a projection of a light bulb that I don't know. Is it two-dimensional or three-dimensional? Don't know. But I can tell you the sun and the moon are completely separate. They have nothing to do with each other. So the sun is just an incandescent light bulb or light image. Let's call it a light image. And the moon is a cool laser, which is completely, you know, the, right. everyone says, well, the, the, the moon is reflecting the sun's light. It's like, no, no, no. Look up. And I know we don't have tons of time. Look up something called the, the moon generates a cold light. And we've done many experiments like to twenty dollars get a point and click infrared thermometer moonlight and moonshade the moon is generating uh, what's known as a cold laser we can make this now i didn't even know it was a thing you can go to any university they say oh yeah you can actually generate lasers to cool things now not like a mr freeze batman ray type thing but you can cool things down and yeah it's just a frequency like anything else and so are they the sun and the moon are they attached to the same fixture that kind of helps them rotate and is that attached to the top of the dome? Or, you know, Do I, like... I mean, at, at that point, I, I don't want to get into, I don't want to give a definite on any of those. And here's why. Sure. Because otherwise we're getting into mechanical versus digital. And, right. you know, I, I, I've got to say this first, which is because this is kind of what I ended the book with, which is, look, if it is, if we're talking about a flat enclosed world, right? If it's flat and it's enclosed, it's probably digital. It's probably virtual because that's how we would build it. And with, so in which case, to answer your question, you wouldn't have to hang the sun and the moon from anything. They're just suspended by whatever force you want to use to hang them from. Because if it's a digital world, you can just kind of defy what we know as physics. Physics kind of go out the window. Right. Physics, are, physics, is only, at physics as we know them only apply to what we know. As far as the building of this place, I think they can just kind of make up physics as they go along. Gotcha. So, what about climate? How right. Are we, how are we creating, you know, different different weather patterns? Anything like that? Do you have a theory? Oh yeah. Something I mean, like do that? the the initial. Uh, I think the initial weather patterns are without humanity work just fine. You know, they just you know the, whether it's the the jet stream up above, the underwater conveyor system in the oceans, or the molten system, or the sun. I think without human beings, I think the weather patterns and everything work just fine, like clockwork. But I and I do believe in climate change to that effect, meaning the term greenhouse gases makes a lot more sense if it's an actual greenhouse. And that is if you're burning just on the cars alone. I mean, remember, a car is just a little mobile furnace. That's all the damn thing is uh, that just happens to, to generate, you know, inertia for, for people. But it's actually generates more heat than anything else. 
Um, Because you're just burning things. That's the whole point. Your internal combustion engine. And that is if you have billions of those things running at any given time and that number just keeps going up and up and up and up, the system, I think the automated system of this place tries to compensate for it. And I think it can, but in the process, it has to shift weather around. And that's why you're seeing weird weather in weird places. Now, do I believe that global warming is a thing? Sure, why not? It's getting really, really hot. I mean, I was getting a tan up here in Seattle last Halloween. That's impossible. That should not happen. And it wasn't like a fluke thing for right. one day. It was like all week. So is there? do I think there's climate change? Yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, do I think we have something to do with it? Yes, I do. But I also think there's an expiration for every civilization before a new one has to be introduced. Not to say that it's the end. Right. Of, not, not necessarily the end of the world, but, you know, like a senior class. It's like you don't have to go home, but you got to get the hell out of here. Yeah, you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Mm -hmm. And um, the the recent solar eclipse, do you think that, that was just a, like a, a matter of randomized rotations lining up? Was it, you know, conjured by the powers that be? What was going on there? Oh, yeah, yeah, the eclipse. I, I No, I think there was a, one of our guys that, that called me who looked up the footage from the eclipse. And he, and he goes, Mark, nothing is causing the eclipse. And I, and I, I'm going, okay, what, what's happening? And he goes, he goes, no, he goes, nothing. He goes, there's no three dimensional object in front of the, the sun. And once he said that, I knew what he meant, which was, he's basically saying that the sun is self eclipsing sort of like what we would do in a planetarium. So like in a planetarium, like the moon, you know, you, we can generate a, a waxing and waning crescent and, and, you know, full moon and all that. And how do you do it? Well, right. you just, you don't create any shadows. You just make the moon. You know, you cast a shadow on the moon. It's just part of the program. We never ever think right. of the sun like that because it's always the sun. We never say half sun, quarter sun, crescent sun, waxing and waning sun. It's always just the sun until you see it in an eclipse. And then all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, what's the difference? It's just a brighter light. It's just the same. It's the same thing, but with, with a bigger light bulb. So you don't have to have anything in front of the sun to do it. Not a three-dimensional object. You can just start shading out the sun on its own, which is what we would do in any sort of simulation. Right. So if since it's not a, a natural occurrence, what is its purpose, do you think? What, the sun or the eclipse? The eclipse. Oh, it's just part of the clock system. Uh, not to go biblical on you or anything, but, I mean, the, the sun... The sun and the moon and the stars were are all were all meant to be part of a clock system, which is again remember clocks weren't haven't been around for that long in human civilization. Yeah, we had sundials, but that's even that took people a while. Before that, it's like people track time at day you know at hours and days and months and years based on what they saw in the sky, and it had to be sort of for lack of a better term universal. So that's that's all it is. So the eclipse is just another cool little clock thing, kind of like a. <laughs> lack of a better term, kind of like the every once in a while, a cuckoo clock, you know, it's not, you know, that, that, you know, every once in a while, the, if you know, the old, old clocks, every once in a while, a dancing couple would come out at the top and spin around. Didn't happen all the time, right. but it happens sometimes. Sure. And just to clarify real quick. So the moon and the sun, you think they're, they are fixed to the same rotational device or no? Uh, sort of maybe, maybe they don't, they don't have to be. Um, the, uh, what we do in, in programming is we call it a sky box and we just put everything in the sky box. So uh, if I had to take a guess, if, if art imitates life and life imitates life, I would say they're all part of the same, the same structure. Gotcha. Interesting. Well, this has been, this has been truly excellent. I want to uh, leave you with one last question. This is our final science question. We feel like kind of, it's an overarching question we kind of want to get down to the bottom of the dome itself sure we want to know your thoughts on how you think the dome was created why is it god i mean who is behind this whole truman show experiment that we are inside of right now gotcha what is you can you can only go one of two directions with this one is an advanced civilization that is much older and more powerful than ourselves or Santa Claus in a bathrobe, a white bathrobe, one, one of those two, because, you know, we're going meaning with, God. Yeah, mean God, the, the divine. Right. And really, right. at that point, you're just kind of splitting hairs because one man's advanced uh, uh, tech is another man's deity. So right. either way, uh, what in, in that case, either way, if if it is like, say, let's say it's an advanced civilization. Uh, and not and not the almighty well they're going to be one step closer to knowing god's phone number than you 
so they're they're more right. powerful. So now, as far as why, for me, it feels like a school. It really does. As I kind of call it, Flat Earth University, which is there's only three things that this world can be. It can be either entertainment, which doesn't make a lot of sense because there's a ton of people that aren't having fun. Uh, it can either be confinement, like a prison. Uh, it's pretty well built for a prison. Awfully nice. I mean, there's a lot of really, really great things for, for a prison. Kind of feels like a school. Kind of feels like we're here to learn something. I mean, in a school, you kind of have a little of both. Sometimes it's fun. Sometimes you're, well, you're always confined to a certain degree unless you want to try to skip school. Uh, but a lot of the times you're just learning things on a, on, a, on a regular basis with some breaks in between for, for levity. And that's what it kind of feels like. It feels like a perspective thing for me. So we're basically being put to a test. Yeah. Yeah. Why not? I what mean, it feels, it feels like that every day that, that we're being tested. And, uh, and, but the thing is, it's, it's okay because even if it is a test, it means you're not alone. It means you have some purpose here and this place was built for you. Kind of like the school was built for you. Right. Do you have aspirations? Like, if you could, would the ultimate goal to be, like, traverse outside of the dome and see what else is beyond? Or, like... Oh, like, sure. If, you know, let's even jumping ahead, let's say, after all, both of our lifetimes, like, what what do you think we should be aspiring to, you know, uh, down the line? Well, world, world peace, obviously. But sure. and that is once... I think... I think it's one of the reasons this topic is coming out now is I think the the universe or the creator or creators or whatever you want to define God as is going to remind us what it's all about, which is like, oh, yeah, you know, you've been having some fun in here, but you really, you know, the, the point of this whole thing is you have to learn, you know, through the chaos and all the strife that you're one, you're part of all one, uh, the same system. You're part of the same family. You're part of the same boat. Right. And which is why I said during the clues, it's like, would you still do all the horrible things you do if you knew that you were being looked over your shoulder by a higher power uh, to where right. like, I, I didn't say this in the clues, but I'll never do anything malicious to anybody ever again. I can't. And so gotcha. that's kind of you know, my my look on life. One more, thank you so much. You've given us so much. I got to ask one more thing. <laughs> okay. So do you. How do we get through the barrier? And have you ever had any interest in going to? Oh the sure! Barrier? Oh absolutely, absolutely. But I think I, I don't think it's as easy as that. I think people have been. I think government groups have been trying for a long time. I mean, they tried with atomic weapons. Uh, they tried with HARP. I think in the '90s, and then they started working. And it's like, okay, well, what else you got? You know, high frequency. It's like, okay, well, HARP's not working. Well, what about we got this CERN thing? Maybe we can open up a Stargate and, and like just walk through it. So I don't think it's just as simple as crossing the ice and walking up to the dome. I don't think it's that simple. I think there's going to be something else involved. But what I really think is right. going to happen is I think somebody is going to show up that's closer to this than we are. Maybe an older civilization. Maybe, you know, maybe there'll be a celestial event. Uh, but I think we're going to be, it's going to be shown to us. I don't think it's something we're, we're necessarily going to have to reach for. I think it's something that's just going to appear. Gotcha. Well, I'll be holding my breath. Yeah, me too. Happens, Mark, you've given us so much to think about, man. This I, has been outstanding. Well, Do thank you, you have anything you want to plug? Like, you know, shows or books, anything like Oh, that? well, no, just, I mean, if you're out on the internet, just type in Flat Earth Clues into Google or my name, uh, Flat Earth Mark Sargent. You'll find my stuff. But, but there's a huge community out there. Just don't. And, and the, the thing I got to stress is, look, don't take my word for it. Look, I'm just some crazy right. guy that's talking about Flat Earth. Um, do I'm not here to convince you. I'm not here to persuade you. I'm just here to throw the idea out there. Do your own research, right. ask questions and figure it out for yourself. Yeah. yeah, I know we certainly will. Are you still collaborating with Patricia at all? Uh, Patricia is taking a break for a while. <laughs> She's, uh, the, 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 troll, the trolls have been getting to her. And, uh, so I'm, I'm in, I'm in contact with her, but, uh, she, she needs a break. Well, give her, give her our best. I will. Please. We hope she gets back on the scene soon. I and, hope so. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks guys. We, we, we can't tell you how much we appreciate it. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll, uh, if you need anything else, let me know. Yeah, we'll be sure to drop you a link once the uh, the episode drops. Yeah, we have your phone number now, so you're going to have to get rid of us somehow. Thanks. Thanks. It's nice. <laughs> All right, Mark. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good night. See you guys. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye.